Welcome to the very first Nick Pod. Uh, this isn't your average kind of a podcast. Uh, you're not going to be able to find it on Apple or any of the regular providers for podcasts because we're going to give away some magic secrets during it, teach a few tricks, and it's not for the general public. Uh, what I'm trying to do here, and I think you're going to enjoy it, is get a combination of old footage, interviews, keep it really moving fast, make it fun, opinionated, uh, and uh, I think we're going to have a good time with it. It's going to be about once a month, just half an hour, so it's not too long to sit through, uh, and you'll find it either on Nick pod.com or lewinenterprises.com. That's where you'll be able to listen to it or download it. And since we're kicking off on the 1st of April, hey, there's going to be a little bit of a comedy angle to this first one. Welcome to the Nick Pod. Well, comedy magic. Uh, I've done it all my life. I've got to tell you, there's a lot to be said for putting comedy with your magic. Because for all the people who like comedy, there's a lot more people who like to laugh at something than like to be fooled by something. So to be commercial, it's a very, very good thing. Now there's visual comedy, there's verbal comedy, uh, and uh, and a blend of the two. So I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of comedy magic and comedy magicians. And we're gonna get into this with a little blast from the past, uh, with one of the great masters of American comedy magic. He got here as soon as he could. Carl Ballantyne, born 27th September 1917, he was known as the Great Ballantyne. Both David Copperfield and Steve Martin have described Ballantyne as the first comedy magician. Boy, he was funny. Whether he was producing a rubber dove or perhaps battling with a piece of rope. Maybe he was shredding a newspaper. He got those laughs and in fact, he battled with that piece of rope almost all his career and all his life. He's fighting with it now. But he did take time off to make McHale's Navy and movies like Speedway with Elvis and a bunch of other great movies and became a very respected comedy actor within the profession. But I think to many of us magicians, we remember that comedy magic the best. Producing crazy props. Doing messy magic. Getting big, big laughs from his audiences. I'll give him the big one now. I'll make the whole audience disappear. Now they go in a study. The pigeon. One. One. Two. Well, you know. Come out, fly. Come out flying. <laughs> Valentine, the world's greatest magician. But uh, how did you start doing comedy magic? What is it, just a brief uh, potted history of uh, fielding I, and comedy? My first exposure to comedy and magic uh, was uh, in, 19, in the fall of 73 in Tallahassee, Florida with Steve Martin. I was uh, a car salesman that lived with some guys that ran a coffee shop at Florida State University. And they said, we have a magician coming. Can you, You've got a car. Can you go to the airport and pick him up? I said, what's his name? They said, Steve Martin. I said, never heard of the guy. And they said, well, he's going to have a banjo case with him and he's got a beard. And, you know, so I go out and I find him and I take him to where he's supposed to stay. And uh, I, I, it was a coffee shop, so there was no dressing area. So I went back and took some condiment boxes and a broom and a, and a tablecloth. And I made him a makeshift 
a dressing room, which he was very thankful for. And I wound up watching him do all of his shows back to back on a Friday night and a Saturday night. And then I had to deliver him back to the airport on Sunday so he could fly out. That's a but pretty good way to get started into comedy magic. I, I thought that my magic was much better than his. I said, this guy's incredibly funny. I'm going to have to learn how to get funny. So. I was lucky enough to have a show for five years performing comedy magic in Vegas. And that's when I had a chance to get to meet no Mac King. Uh, Mac is just simply one of the finest comedy magicians on the planet. Uh, and you know, to see him work is to understand the intricacies that you can go to to make comedy magic funny. He has callbacks on callbacks. Uh, it's it's brilliant comedy. But this this goes back a ways. I had a talk show uh, back in Vegas called The Entertainment Files. I got to interview some magicians. I thought you might like to see some oh, probably 25-year-old footage of Mac talking a little bit about how he started in magic. Of course, Mac is still around. Uh, he has never left Vegas. And he now has the longest running show in Las Vegas uh, at the Excalibur now. And I urge you to see it if you have a chance. But now let's take a little time ship back and uh, see Mac back in those days on the entertainment files. Please hang up and try again. Probably the uh, world's wildest magic. The world's wildest magic. Yeah. Is that the one where you did thing with fish? Yeah. That was great. You came in one day to the, the theater and said, well, can I do a quick thing in the show? I don't know what you did. It was the most disgusting thing I've ever seen. <laughs> there were goldfish coming out of your spit mouth. Spitting out fish. It was great. <laughs> spitting out fish. You do weird stuff, don't you? Uh, um, yeah, I'm trying to do weird stuff. I mean, yeah. I, mean, I want it to be funny, but different. And like your act. Well, I, you know, yeah. It, it, you've got a style, though. You've got that wonderful kind of a goofy. You yeah, walk like out a people. a dork. Oh, you doing know. Doing magic tricks. <laughs> That's what, me. I walk out smooth and sharp. Then they realize I'm a dork five minutes into it. That's the... <laughs> little, we do this, sort of have the opposite act, don't well, we? Yeah. It's a little bit of that within magic. So, but when did you start magic? When uh, I always like to know that. What age were you when you I first like got hooked? six years old when I oh, first oh. started. I was a little kid. Both my grandfathers were like amateur magicians. So mm -hmm. they would teach me uh, magic tricks as I was growing up. Uh, mostly they would do tricks for me and then I would beg them to learn. And one grandfather in particular had a lot of magic books and he would point out the magic books on the shelf and he'd say, well that trick is in one of those books. And uh, I'd have to find pour through. Book. Yeah, so it was basically a scam to get me to read. <laughs> Our first castle story is a humorous incident that uh, I enjoyed. I was in the castle at the time when it happened. And it's about the great Albert Goshman. Now, Albert was probably one of the finest sleight of hand magicians in the world. His coin work was immaculate, which was a little more than you could sometimes say about Albert. He had a tendency to look a little bit uh, tousled, wrinkled outfit, and, uh, uh, and a lot of grease stains. Uh, it was almost impossible for Albert to walk from one side of the castle and not to take a short trip through the dining room uh, and zip into the kitchen briefly and take a bite and nosh on well, you know, whatever was there and then go to the other side. So very often by the end of the evening, he'd accumulated quite a few stains uh, and uh, uh, greasy spots on his outfit. That was just Albert. Uh, and you may say, why am I talking about Albert in a comedy pod? Well, if you never saw Albert work, he was hysterical. Not only did he do the brilliant magic, but Every time that coin arrived under a salt shaker, it got funnier and funnier and funnier. And his wonderful New York attitude uh, uh, just made him a uniquely humorous, talented performer in the close-up area. Uh, I was interested the other day, I was interviewing Martin Lewis uh, for an upcoming story in Banish about his 
new, amazingly good book, Making Magic. Uh, and Martin told me, in fact, that it was seeing Albert that had made him become a magician, in spite of having a father who was uh, uh, legendary in the magic business, Eric Lewis. Uh, he saw Albert Goshman on his 21st birthday at the Magic Castle, and he just saw it, came out, said, right, I want to do magic. And that's what started it for Martin. But I'm going to go back. I'm going to take you back to that castle story, because what happened on this particular evening was Albert had been booked to do a rather important corporate event, a close up show in the seance room. And the booker, knowing Albert quite well, wanted him to look absolutely immaculate, uh, wanted him, you know, dressed right and uh, none of those grease stains or anything like that. So he not only communicated this to Albert, but also to Albert's wife, uh, who made absolutely sure, since this was a big booker, uh, that this was the case. And he arrived at the castle. He had white gloves on, so his hands didn't get dirty. His suit was perfect. It was unwrinkled. And uh, he had a little bit of time to kill whilst they finished the meal in the seance room. And, uh, well, what happened next has become a legend. Uh, he walked in to do his show and looking so spectacularly un Albert like uh, in his uh, pristine uh, dress and uh, his suit uh, looking perfect. And the booker kind of gave him a little approving nod, and Albert kind of nodded back, and they knew what was what on that, why it was happening. And before he went into the show, Albert just quietly went, oh, and reached inside his inside pocket and pulled out a turkey leg, which he'd got from the kitchen. and. He took a few bites of this and put it back in his pocket and then went on with the show. Uh, uh, he wasn't going to be told what he could or couldn't eat. And it was a, and it was just a wonderful evening. Everyone at the castle was totally cracked up over this. And it's just one of many Albert stories, but it's a nice one for this occasion. That was the great Albert Goshman. <laughs> You do something which is less usual. You, of course, uh, have done some very funny illusions. Uh, there's only a handful of people I think have been really, and we've got one of them here today, Ray Anderson, who uh, uh, manages to do grand illusion and make it extremely funny at the same time. Uh, so you, you've done your comedy work. You do comedy manipulative. You make uh, dove magic funny and you make illusions funny. Well, the uh, sub truck, so the sub truck, based on the Rocky Horror Picture Show, people calling me the Rocky Horror Magician, because I was in the Frankenfurter black fishnet hose and bustier on top of the sub trunk. Uh, also, the levitation where the girl falls from the ceiling and lands behind the table. Uh, I, I, I always wanted to see magic on a broader, uh, especially if you're going to do illusions. I want to see it on a broader screen. Uh, Broad strokes, if you, if you please, uh, well, so that the comedy right. plays. It doesn't matter what culture. If the Chinese saw the, it, if the Europeans saw it, South Americans saw it, it would all play the same. I think one of the things that it's worth stressing as we talk about this, as people are watching, uh, is that uh, we both had long-term careers, uh, and there's an old saying, yucks is bucks and funny is money. Uh, and when you're actually, we, uh, I love magic, I love strong magic, but uh, whether you're, whatever kind of magic you're doing, I think uh, adding comedy to it makes it uh, uh, a much more commercial, viable, Cell. We've got another gem I want to introduce you to. This is Oreo. He's what's called a rescue rat. I had rescued him from the alley out back. But you the end of the whip is traveling faster than the internet at my hotel. There he is. How's it going? All right. Well, so 
this is the three of us right here. And, uh, you know, watching that clip off you, Louis, uh, reminded me there's a great quote uh, from the, the wonderful French comedian Jacques Tati. Uh, he used to say, comedy begins with the feet. Uh, and that moment <laughs> where you're pointing at the kid, the actual angle of your feet uh, is, is very funny. The, the angles in that comedy through. So did I Did I hit most of those? Uh, you, you've done many other things, I know. But how long have you been doing comedy magic? Um, I got started when I was, I mean, I was always a dopey kid. So, you know, my whole life, I guess. But I got started doing it really when I was about 18 years old. Um, I decided what I had to figure out how to make a living doing this. And it's much easier to fill time if you have jokes than just talking with nothing else. If you just do the trick. So and, and that's, who, was, who was your inspiration? How did you uh, get into doing comedy as well as what you're doing? So when I was 17 years old, I saw two shows in uh, I managed to get four hours away from home in Minnesota to sneak into a casino to see the Raspini brothers and they're a juggling duo and they're amazing. But that's what introduced me to kind of the high laugh per minute and like, Oh, you can have all of these jokes within your thing. Um, and then I, when I was 17, also I went to the desert magic seminar and saw a little show at the Maxim where <laughs> the guy named Nick Lewin was doing <laughs> And then that kind of showed me how to apply this kind of last per minute thing that um, that the Raspinis were doing to a magic show because magic is different from juggling. I want to talk just for a moment about comedy clubs. Uh, for 11 years, I got to work in comedy clubs and all that stage time was wonderful. It taught me really how to make a trick work and fly the comedy within it. But I think just as important was the amount of time I got to spend with comedians. Uh, magicians, for the most part, spend time with magicians. And the emphasis is all about the magic. Of course it is. But when you're with comedians, you would start to notice how differently they operated in a different set of rules. Uh, and I was always impressed that comedians never stopped writing. They all had a notebook that they were writing in and they would write down ideas nonstop uh, and they would try them out. But mostly what they did, they would take a joke and they would see how many words they could cut out and make it funny. There's a bit of a tendency in magic to, uh, to use too many words with the comedy. Uh, if, and Jay Leno had a wonderful saying. He said, to tell a joke and if it gets a laugh cut a word out try it again if it still gets a laugh cut out another word and it is so true uh, and it's very important to be able to make that comedy concise uh, you're not looking for extra words to make it funny always look for less words to make it funny uh, and that I certainly learned with the comedians I also learned how seriously comedy uh, is handled uh, in magic, uh, there's an awful tendency for people to see a routine and to, to steal it. Uh, really, there's no other words. Oh, I saw it on YouTube, therefore I can do it. I've had people say that to me. Uh, and comedy does not work that way. The comedians, if you took a hunk from someone's act. Now, just like magic, there are certain lines that you might call stock lines. But don't forget, every stock line started being original sometime. And I hear people say things, uh, and say, oh, well, that's a stock line. I go, no, it's not. Actually, I know who came up with that when. Uh, so comedians are very, very careful about the way their material is preserved in that. They don't want people taking it. Uh, in Magic, we have a million books, a million DVDs, a million podcasts, uh, and uh, there's all kinds of access to material. It isn't really that way in comedy. Uh, comedians do not share things in that manner. There are joke books, 
Uh, but you, you won't find any comedian worth his salt telling you a joke he found in a joke book. Uh, that's something that uh, has happened in magic over the years. The uh, uh, Bob Orban kind of uh, zingers, hummers, different, you know, uh, uh, different topics uh, and uh, feel that you can sprinkle them in the act while they work. Well, that's OK. It's just not the way comedians work. Uh, they 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 strive to come up with something that's a little bit different, their own take. And in doing that, they do something very special. They really create their own persona and personality on stage. There's nothing generic about it. Uh, and one of the big things that you would hear about magicians, and I, I was a headliner for 11 years, and a lot of resentful feelings. Nobody liked to think a magician was <laughs> uh, topping the bill at a comedy club. So you had to really prove yourself. And I would consistently hear, well, magicians do all the, they all do the same tricks and they tell the same jokes. And sadly, there's a little bit of a truth to it. Uh, and uh, when you were working at comedy clubs, a great living over the years, you could go out and get fabulous stage time to learn what you do. Um, but uh, when, when you were doing that, you had to really make sure that you were as funny as the comedians. So everybody who really made a big impact uh, in the comedy world, really headlined, would learn how to do a monologue up front, five or six minutes at least, so that they would be able to uh, be as funny as the comedians. And no one said, oh, well, we're only laughing because he's a magician or, it's, or the trick went wrong or whatever it is. So that was kind of the way it went. You think of the Michael Finneys uh, and people like that who were able to just stand up there and do a set piece of comedy. Also, comedians changed their every day. If the news changed, their, their act changed. And that's a great thing. And uh, uh, I always say that the difference between a comedian and a magician is that uh, uh, if a magician finds a line that works and gets a laugh, it's going to be in his act forever. Uh, and a comedian, when he finds a laugh that gets uh, every time a big reaction, that joke really kills. Well, just about the time it's getting perfect, He's dropped it from his act because they want to keep everything moving and fresh. Uh, so uh, what I did in the comedy clubs and it really did well, I started off with a monologue. One day I'll put up my opening monologue from back in the 80s. Uh, but I always like to finish with the torn and restored newspaper, which is a great piece of magic. It's visual, the magic is strong, but it allowed me when I was doing it to think about what had happened during the day. If there was some news, whatever the event was, you'd be able to look through the paper. Oh, look at that. Uh, and to make a, a reaction uh, as if it were an ad lib. It wouldn't be an ad lib, but it would kind of have that look. And of course, you'd have some set jokes that you would put in there uh, and that you would know they would work. And because it was so obviously an impromptu type of a thing, you got a lot of credit for being topical and keeping it fresh. So I thought just for the heck of it, um, I'm going to show you my torn and restored newspaper. This wasn't from a comedy club, but I think you'll get the idea and uh, see why I found it such an effective way to do comedy and to finish out in those great comedy club gigs. Of the Asa today. <laughs> this fine piece of journalism. This is the journalism of hostess colors are to nutrition. <laughs> I'm standing, by front of, standing in front of the machine, I'm waiting for a guy to put eight quarters in, though I move quicker than he did. He wasn't happy, but you can't argue with things like me. I am going to create the illusion of tearing this newspaper in half. I'm not really going to do it. I'm just going to create the illusion of tearing it in half. Or half, as you say. <laughs> we invented the language, you just screwed it up. <laughs> That's not true. No, no, no. The English and the Americans have always gone on. Well, the only time we ever squabbled was over the War of Independence. By the way, how are you enjoying life without taxation? <laughs> Uh, 
hurrying back to the Amway, taking the tea bags from the coffee shop and throwing them into the swimming pool. <laughs> I love that. Wasn't that a great hotel? Oh, it's so ritzy. No wonder Amway is so damn expensive. <laughs> Half just like that, the strength of Hulk Hogan, the body of Fred Flintstone. <laughs> Can he do it again? Yes. Another book. There's a story from Australia. Australian scientists have discovered, they have proven that plants can silently communicate with each other. Isn't that incredible? Isn't that astounding? They're scientists in Australia. <laughs> One more, one more tear down the head. Yes, like that. Top man hit by train is critical. I'd be downright abusive. Jokes are just for me. Now you might sit in the on TV and then walk out of stage and instantly the stall of in one before you can say Gene Anderson. <laughs> It's a bifurcated piece of magic. And I'm going to do it in slow motion. And that is the toughest way to fool any audience with any kind of magic. Because it is the quickness of the hand that deceives the eye. I believe that or you wouldn't see so many black eyes around. <laughs> Don Lawton, 1943. <laughs> Watch closely. Watch very closely. You really may believe you see that newspaper getting bigger. In fact, in slow motion, you may even think that you see those tornadoes start to blend together. In fact, you may even think that you see that newspaper totally restored. But that could never happen because that would be just an illusion. And this is just today's copy of the Usser. Thank you very much. With comedy and magic, uh, wh what do you think of the, the toughest part? How about you, Fielding? What do you think of the toughest things in combining comedy and magic? I, I think we I think we have to go back and revisit what Penn and Teller always said. When they say comedy and magic, there's usually very little comedy and very little magic. So build, building from there on, uh, it's always been my position to to have the comedy be visual. In other words, if I'm doing something, be it with the bird or the trunk, or I'm tearing up a newspaper or pouring water on a floor or firing a bird out of a cannon, all of these things visually have to have a physical funniness about them. I don't believe in doing like joke, magic trick, joke, magic trick. I believe that it, visually it has to say, hey, this is funny. Well, that's interesting. I, and, and I think probably you're kind of the same on that, aren't you? You do very visual comedy, uh, Louie. I do a lot of visual. I also do a lot of verbal uh, because I kind of follow almost a juggler format, which is introduce the prop, joke, joke, or introduce the bit, joke, 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 introduce the prop, joke, 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 do the bit, joke, 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 do the trick, then close it out. Well, and I, I do almost total verbal comedy. With me, it's joke, joke, joke. Uh, but the one thing that I, I've found to be very important is to make sure that the magic is strong. And that Penn and Teller quote is a very good one because uh, you want the magic to be strong and you want the comedy to be strong. To me, well, one of the big problems that can pop up with doing a comedy magic show is that if, if you get people laughing too much and they're on that track, suddenly it's kind of a pain when a trick comes up and they don't want to stop laughing. Or if the magic is so good, uh, then, uh, oh, we'll stop telling jokes and do another trick. So to me, it's always been a bit of a tightrope walk uh, between the two. <laughs> There's one thing that can make you a, a funnier performer. What do you think it is? I, I, in my case, I would say it's stage time. Uh, you, you can't be funny unless you have plenty of time. You just stage. answered the question, Nick. I, I... I always volunteer to young performers that they, before they start defining themselves as a performer or before they rush out to Vegas or the Magic Castle or whatever venue there is for magicians, that they need to have a minimum 
a minimum of 1,000 shows under their belt. 1,000 shows will help define uh, their stage timing, their, their sensitivity to an audience, and, and they're able to hear. They're able to hear a, a, an audience. Instead of just rolling over the audience, they're able to get that ebb and flow going back and forth where they're communicating. Jed's agreeing well, that. And that's just it. It's all about stage time. I came up working comedy rooms and stand-ups are stage time is more precious than gold, where if you read on the internet forums, they go, I don't leave the house for th you know less than $500. Like, no, you got to try your stuff. That's how you get good is, is doing it. I believe a joke idea, a trick idea belongs on stage, not in a notebook, not in your living room. You got to go out and you got to try and see if it works. <laughs> very fast trick that I've had a lot of fun with over the years. It was taught to me by my mentor, Ken Brook. And uh, I used to take lessons from Ken. And every now and then he said, well, I'm going to teach you something extra that, uh, I, that I don't put out and I don't market. And this was it. I later discovered it actually came from an idea by Carol Fox. Ken was never great on actually attributing to people uh, in the past who'd come up with some of his stuff. He was an occasional gap in that. So I discovered that later. But I want to share it with you. Uh, and it's a very simple little card trick. And it's one, as I say, that I've used ever since. Like so many card tricks, ah, you begin with having a card selected. So you say to jump, sir, say stop anytime you like. Oh, there. Okay, take a look at the card you stopped me at. Make sure everyone has seen it. And then you ask the gentleman to rest it on the palm of his hand, just like that. So that's resting there just like that. And you say, now I, I, I'm going to, and you keep coming a little closer to it. So your card was the, um, Oh, and almost pretending that there is some kind of a marking on the back of the card and you can't quite, well, the light isn't quite right. Let me just put my glasses on. And then as you bend down, put your glasses on, you look and say, oh, it was the two of clubs. Was that it? Was it the two of clubs? And you're left with that visual <laughs> at the end. And... Uh, it's, it's a silly thing uh, for very little money, 20 bucks, you could make it up. Try it for yourself. You may be shocked how well it goes. I don't think I have much to teach you. Uh, you've got a pair of glasses with uh, two miniature cards on it, two of clubs. Is. Now I'm working with this camera here. I would normally have that in my inside pocket so I could pull them out very easily. People couldn't sit. You might just blacken the edges of those. I just made this up just to show you on this one. And then you got a force a card. And I, I'm just going to say this here and now. Uh, I never, ever want to see a magician again who forces a card with a bad slip cut when they do one of these things and flip the top one off to there. Because you know what? It never looks good. Uh, it always looks like there's something seriously wrong going on. So let me do briefly show you how uh, to do a better version of that. And that is have the card on the top. You start to do a cut, a little little swivel cut, and then you slide that top card off as you turn the cards up like that so they don't see much. It just looks like you're cutting them. What you've really done is you have slid that card from the top. It goes over here. You keep a little finger break underneath it there. And then you put the rest of the cards on top. It looks like really nothing happened at all. Then you do the riffle force, which is so much better than the slip force. Say stop anytime. They can stop anytime. And all you do, you've got that big break at the back right there. I think I'll break my wrist showing you down to here. That's to, they say stop there. And you pick up and you just pick up at the break at the back and show it. Uh, so much more elegant. So you force that card and then you have it, place it on the hand. And it's all in the way you sell it at that point. You have to be 
keep peering down at it like you can't quite read it. And you'll actually hear, oh, I bet they're marked. Uh, and oh, well, and, uh, <laughs> my eyesight isn't where it well, I just need my glasses. A lot of people are familiar with the fact that you, you could use special glasses to read markings and you put it on. And when you come up for that finale at the end, when you look up and they're not expecting it, you do this, you've got that wonderful look on your face there, and then they see that and you hold up the two of clubs. Uh, you will get a big laugh. You may be surprised. <laughs> this may be the one that people remember more than any others in your show. Just a quick story. Well, thank you for being there for my number one Nick part. I hope you enjoyed it. It's a work in progress. Uh, if you have any ideas, let me know anything you want me to cover. Uh, we have all kinds of ideas lined up for the future. So uh, check on in and come and join us on uh, Nick pod number two. Mm -hmm.